Hello and welcome to Kevin's Corner TV. My name is Kevin Gordon and I'm the editor of the Gold Coast Gazette, a weekly newspaper established in 1991 along with my mother. The newspaper covers the North Shore of Long Island and over the years I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of interesting people. Through this show, I hope to introduce you to some of those people. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Howdy! Welcome to this week's episode of Kevin's Corner TV. I'm here with Will Hutchins, better known as Sugarfoot. Will, thank you for being on the show. This is a great honor. You were one of the first people I thought of when I thought about doing this show. This is great. Now, Will, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, <laughs> it was sort of like the old West. We roared across the TV screens for a brief period of time, riding and roping and shooting, and then we just kind of all bit the dust. But well, you did sugar for that. Uh, it went from 57 to 61. Okay. And uh, besides Sugarfoot, the TV series, yeah. you've done quite a few movies as well. What are some of those movies? Well, shall I show that? Yes. This is my favorite, Clambake with Elvis. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's, it's En Fuga de Su Destino, In Search of His Destiny or something. That's kind of a dull title. I just prefer clam bake, but that I, that I never had a better time in my life. Really? And yeah, working he, with Elvis Oh, he, he was just a wonderful person. Jeez, he was the king, and yet he was also one of his subjects. He, he, just, he, he was just a great guy. Right. And we had more fun working on that. Uh, and that, this scene here, uh, we're in the lab trying to make this stuff called glop or something, I forget, to put on his racing boat so the boat will go faster through the waves. Kind of cheating, would you mm -hmm. say? I don't mm -hmm. think the other, you know, it's like car racing. You have to be specifications there. But we, anyhow, I, I made up a gag that I'd seen. Have you ever heard of Cantinflas, a great Mexican comedian? Right. Okay. Well, he was like the biggest star in the world at one time. But I saw a movie of his called El Super Sabio once, and he's in the laboratory at the beginning. He's doing all this, and, and, shh, shh, and shh. then the noon whistle blows. He puts on a bib and mixes it up, and he's got a little martini there. So I, I, I took that gag and I was in the lab, we were working on this, and I'm going, Shush. and then I stir it and I start to drink it. And Elvis goes, ah, and I said, no, needs a little more sugar. You want some coffee? <laughs> and we, that was the whole picture. We just made stuff up. Oh, we, nice, really. It, and the director, Arthur Nadell, what a peach of a guy. He let us do it. He mm -hmm. just let us go. And he said, I'm used to this man. Oh, well, see, it was his, uh, Elvis's last movie before he uh, married the lovely Priscilla. So it was one big stag party. The movies were my religion, and the, 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 the neighborhood Bijou was my church. Mm. So that, that's kind of what got you into movies? Well, yeah, I, I grew up in Atwater in L.A., which is between the L mighty, it was a mighty L.A. river then before they filled it all in, and the Glendale Railroad tracks and uh, Atwater. And they used to shoot a lot of, right across the river was Glen, uh, Griffith Park. Mm -hmm. And the great director, King Vidor, said, a tree is a tree, shoot it in Griffith Park. So they're always shooting movies over there. and we hop on our Schwinn bikes and go over there and watch. And it was so exciting. And then one day they said, uh, they're shooting a movie up at Beach's Market where I worked uh, after school in the produce department. So we went up there on our bikes and we were shooting a scene from a, a W.C. Fields movie, Never Give a Sucker an Even Break. And this particular shot, the W.C. Fields car is somehow uh, hooked onto a hook and ladder <laughs> uh, engine and, and they were sw swooping down uh, Hyperion Bridge, and they did a U-turn right there at the uh, Beaches Market where I work. And so, you see that shot, it's only on the screen for two or three seconds, but in the background is a crowd, and I'm in that crowd. Ah. And we got a free lunch. That so was that, your first show? Yeah. That was your first movie? And, uh, now, now drop some names of some people that you uh, worked with. And, I'll and name anybody. I, I, I've run into everybody. Yeah. And some of them are nice, and some of them are not so nice. So, some yeah. of them seem to be glad to see you, and some of them don't have time. It's, right. a, it's a weird business. I never figured I established a beachhead, really. I was always hanging by my thumbs, mm -hmm. which is hard to do on a beach. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the tide kept sweeping me back out. Right, but right. Uh, I, I, my, my uh, boyhood hero, you, you, have you ever heard of Harold Lloyd, the great son of screen comedian? Sure, sure. Well, he was one of the top ones. And my grandparents lived next to Foxy Lloyd, his dad. Mm -hmm. So I'd go over there and, and soak up the lore of Harold Lloyd, the great Harold Lloyd. And, uh, and you couldn't see his movies in those days, except the ones he'd bring out, which was only one or two when, when I was a kid. But when he died, the family brought all the movies out, and you can see them all now. And they, it, originally they showed them at UCLA at night, 
And I, at the time, I was working as a clown for the city of L.A. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a politician. Mm -hmm. I formed a clown troupe. And we did all these clown shows. And every Friday night, I'd hustle that through that show. We'd do it like a sped-up movie. Do, do, do. It's supposed to take 40 minutes. We'd do it in 20. So I'd get out to UCLA. they see these great Harold Lloyd movies with the organist. Uh, and, and so a, year, uh, uh, a few years before that, I made a pilot called Gunshy. I, I played a goofy cowboy. And uh, I did a couple of falls I'd seen Harold Lloyd do in like Professor Viewer and some of his movies. And as luck would have it, Harold Lloyd saw it. He mm -hmm. said, that's the only guy I can think of that can do my kind of stuff. Let's do a TV series. Right. So we were going to do a TV series uh, with Harold Lloyd producing and using all of his gags. And it was about a small town veterinarian. And the opening shot, they had worked out. I, I walked to town. It's so small. I walked to town, and all the dogs and cats are following me down the street. Mm -hmm. That's as far as it went. Mm -hmm. uh, Hollywood is a, a town of broken dreams, and, and a thousand projects, and one gets through, maybe. Right, right, so that's the way right. it goes. Okay, now that's the Dobie Carey Award. Uh, I was in a con uh, one of these Western conventions in, uh, in Virginia once, and sat at a table with Dobie Carey and let him know that my favorite boxer, I love boxing, my favorite boxer of all time was Joe Lewis. Nothing fancy about him. He came in with a tattered uh, robe and a towel on his head, and and, uh, and and Dobie Carey's face lit up. Harry Carey Jr., the son of the great Harry Carey, and he, Harry Carey Jr. worked with John Ford a lot, and uh, they wrote a great book called Company of Heroes about working on location. There's nothing like working on location. You're you're in your own world, and it's always tough to come back to civilization. So he, his face lit up and he invited me to his convention in, in Durango, Colorado, and that was the award. And then the next one is the Golden the, the Boot The Golden award. Boot, they give that, uh, they used to give it every year at a big banquet in L.A., uh, sort of like an Oscar for, for odors, people that worked in westerns. And I had to give a speech and I was so scared, that I, I never did get over giving speeches, how scared I got. So I worked on that for about a year, and I got, blah, 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 you know, you've heard me today. <laughs> and, uh, but that's, that's very heavy, and you can use it for a paperweight, but I don't. <laughs> and then the one in the middle is the Buffalo Bill Award. They called me at uh, Nebraska a few years ago to, do, uh, to be the Grand Marshal of the big parade for the annual Buffalo Bill Award in Nebraska, and they, they just treated me just great. You always get treated great at these things. That's me, uh, 50 pounds and 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's Sugarfoot. Uh, uh, he was uh, Sugarfoot was a guy that's working his way up to being a tenderfoot. Mm -hmm. So I was always getting beat up, and yeah, but I was studying law by uh, mail order. And every time I'd go into town and I'd go to the post office first and ask for my latest assignment, and then I'd get in trouble. I'd go into the bar, everybody's drinking husky, and I'd say sarsaparilla with a dash of cherry, please, and the fight was on. <laughs> I was an equal opportunity punch out. I, I knock guys out and they knock me out. Now what was Sugarfoot about actually? What? About an hour. No, I meant the, the, <laughs> the premise. <laughs> the premise was that he was just uh, easy going, uh, Sugarfoot, Sugarfoot, easy loping, cattle roping, Sugarfoot, carefree as a tumbleweed, a jogging along with a heart full of song and a rifle and a volume of the law. Sugarfoot, Sugarfoot, easy lope, never estimate it, never underestimate a Sugarfoot. Once he gets his dander up, ain't no one is faster on the draw. You'll find him on the side of law and order, from the Mexicali border to the rolling hills of Arkansas. Oh, Sugarfoot, Sugarfoot, easy loping, cattle roping, Sugarfoot, riding down to Cattle Town, a jogging along with a heart full of song and a rifle and a volume of the law. Boom. <laughs> yeah, very good, very good. <laughs> and then that one there, that's how I met my wife when I was on Broadway back in 64 uh, and 65. Mm -hmm. And she came to see the show, and we've been pals ever since. And that's Dennis O'Keefe, the great Dennis O'Keefe, and Martha Scott and me. And uh, I just love working with those people. I love working on the stage. It's, it's, it's really scary, but it's... It, Adrenaline mm. uh, inducing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, how many Broadway shows did you do? That's the only one. That's the one? And that was called what? The play Never Too Late. It was the longest running play on Broadway at the time. Right, right. Uh, besides a musical. Right. Oh, well, New, Newsday interviewed Babs and me a few years ago, and a, 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 a pastor uh, 
Russ Sacco, uh, <clears throat> out north there, out, out in uh, Long Island, uh, read the article and, uh, and got, got in touch with me. And uh, he makes these uh, little statuettes. He, he's a, religi a very religious guy. He's a pastor. And he does a lot of biblical things. But then he's done Elvis and, and uh, Batman and all those. And so I went out to his house. And it was like a miniature wax museum. And uh, that was uh, uh, that was really neat. What, what town is Russ in again? Deer Park. Deer Park. Deer Park. My Didn't somebody write a book is. called Deer Park once? Yeah. Look, at, look at the comic book. Now, the way I met you was through the newspaper. We have that name, the Celebrity Contest. Yeah. And you seem to know all the people that we put in the paper personally. Well, I, I grew up in the... Clint, Clint Eastwood, for example, you worked with? Yeah, I worked with him in the first uh, movie I ever did called uh, Lafayette Escadrille, the story of William Wellman's experiences in the Lafayette Flying Corps during World War I. Right. And uh, his son played... His son, William Wellman Jr., played William Wellman. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the only time that's ever happened, at least I can think of. Right, right. And I played one of the, the guys that, that went over to fly in World War One. They're all, all true characters. And I had billing over Clint Eastwood. What do you think of that? Nice. So anyhow, uh, later, many, many years later, I worked in Magnum Force mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Clint Eastwood. Mm -hmm. I didn't even get billing in that one. Oh, I still get residuals, so Clint... Oh, Keep it up. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, uh, the director, uh, I don't think uh, it was much uh, taken with me, so he went to the bathroom or something, and when he went to the bathroom, Clint directed the scene. And, oh, yeah, and, and then he got, and later he, he got into it. Well, he, one, time of time. His reason, uh, one of the reasons he's so successful is he brings them in on, on, on under budget or on, right on budget, and no waste of time. Right, right. So that was interesting. All right, and then who else? Well, I made a movie, Babs uh, Likes It A Lot, it's called The Shooting. I don't know if anyone's seen it, but it's on television again. Occasionally, uh, years ago, I used to know uh, Jack Nicholson pretty well. We palled around, and and I just done a, a play in in New York for a couple of years, and uh, I got married there. And um, for a honeymoon, we went to Kanab, Utah, and made this movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 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 Jack Nicholson was in it. Uh, Millie Perkins, wonderful Millie Perkins, and Frank Fame, and great old Warren Oates. Just the four of us and a few subsidiary parts, and we shot it in order. The, the, Page one, we shot right through the order of the script because it was one long journey mm. on horseback, mm. and uh, and I got top billing. That's how times change. And uh, in fact, in fact, the picture was never released until Jack hit it big. Then they brought it out, starring right. Jack Nicholson. Right, 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 right. <laughs> My real name's Marshall Hutchison, and they shortened it to Will Hutchins. Mm. And uh, they said it's too long for a marquee, Will Hutchins. And uh, a year later, they hired Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Okay, now where's Babs? Because you had Hey Babs! No, that's okay, that's okay. I wanna you had uh, you were you were married to Carol Burnett's sister. No no. Right. Uh, uh, I was married to uh, Chris Chris Burnett. And Carol Burnett was her sister. Oh, okay. you know, she would, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, in fact, I met both my wives in New York. I was there, '64 and '65, doing Never Too Late. Right. Uh, replaced uh, Orson Bean. You could never replace Orson Bean. That was the longest-running play on Broadway. They, they changed. Uh, uh, eventually, after I'd done it for, uh, on, for a year on there, uh, Arthur Godfrey took over, and I was replaced by Richard Mulligan. Mm. Uh, what a stew. Uh, anyhow. Uh, uh, I'm going to work one day, it's a matinee, I'm going down the alley toward the, uh, the, the pop in the entrance, you know, actor's entrance, and this pretty little girl comes up to me and says, Hello, Mr. Hutchins, my name is Barbara Torres, I'm a national thespian. I have to say that right. <laughs> and I said, just call me Will. And she said, <clears throat> okay. Hello, Will. My name is Barbara mm -hmm. Torres, and I'm a national thespian. <laughs> well, did I, little did I know that uh, Quite a few years later, we get hitched. Mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. Babs. And that's Babs. But well, in the interim, yeah. I was married to uh, uh, Chris Burnett uh, for about three years. And we had a daughter. We still have a daughter uh -huh. named Jenny. She lives out in Peoria, Arizona. Uh, okay. Yeah, she went to school in Sedona and loved Arizona so much that she settled there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Show biz. I only had two wives. That's not too much. That's good. Yeah, I know. In show business. <laughs> and bad, You're bad, bad to tell. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, they've got all these old TV shows released now, uh, all the series. 
Warner Brothers no, never saw fit to release mine, so I have to scrape them out as best I can. Half of them look as if they've been shot through a Navajo blanket, you know, they're not in very good condition, <laughs> but some of them are really good. And one is our pilot, Brandigan's Boots, which was a movie with that, Will Rogers. That was the pilot for Chicken Fun? It was based on a Will Rogers Jr. movie, Boy from Oklahoma. Okay. So there we have Will Rogers again, right. who's my favorite movie actor, actually. He made up his own dialogue in there. Anyhow, so we did the pilot, and it sold. And uh, in the movie, Billy the Kid was played by Merv Griffin or somebody like that. But in our show, it was played by Dennis Hopper. Mm. And now, uh, Jimmy Dean has just died. Yeah, and I used to see Jimmy Dean around town, and he was really a wild character, you know, and they, they, that method was really in, in, in vogue then. I never could get the, uh, I th figured the method was uh, just imitating Marlon Brando, that's what everybody was doing. It, it, I'm sure Stanislavski would not have approved. So anyhow, uh, uh, Dennis Hopper was a devout uh, uh, method yeah. actor. So I, I was really scared. Uh, he came into town and, he, and, he, and he, they hired him to shoot me. He was a hired gun. And so I was scared of Billy the Kid shooting me, but I was more scared of working with, more scared of working with Dennis Hopper who just worked with uh, Jimmy D Dean and Rebel Without a Cause. Mm -hmm. In fact, I went to the, the sneak preview that at, uh, when I was at UCLA, it was at the UCLA uh, uh, Theater there in UCLA. And, uh, Jimmy Dean was there, and Sal Minio, and some of the other people, and uh, and I, Jimmy Dean just sat there like this, and, and when the picture was over, he just kept sitting there. And I said, I thought, I bet he's got some good thoughts about what he just saw himself do, mm -hmm. do there. So working with Dennis was uh, really exciting, a good way to start out. Sure. And he was a terrific guy, uh, very good with a camera. He One was, of the TV shows that you did was Blondie, right? And yeah. Dagwood. Blondie. Yes, I'm the world's only living Dagwood. I'm very proud of that. Wow. We wow. only lasted half a season. Uh, I played Dagwood and Dagwood Lost, but I loved doing it. I loved doing that show. Was, uh, the producer, Joe Conley, did uh, Leave it to Beaver and Amos and Andy. He was a wonderful guy. I'd go into his office to discuss things. Warners, they never let me discuss things. But uh, I'd go into his office and he'd give me a shot of whiskey and we'd uh, we had some good times there discussing. Right, right. <laughs> Excellent. That, that was a big show. A lot, lot, of, lot, of lot, of visual, lot of visual comedy. Now, did you do crap falls and stuff? Oh, yeah. There's one about? scene where I'm supposed to fall down the stairs, and the director, Gene Nelson, famous tap dancer, wanted me to kind of scoop down the stairs. He said, we can speed it up. And I said, geez, I don't know. And little Billy Curtis, one of the munchkins, uh -huh. he used to stand in, uh, he sta stood in for my, uh, the, the boy that played my kid. Because he could only work so many hours a day, right. so Billy Curtis, he was a, you know, he's a midget. And he, he says, Come on. I went over there. And I said, Yeah. He says, You want to know how to go down the stairs? Uh, I used to see Laurel and Hardy. I know how they used to do it. And I said, Yeah, anything, anything. He says, Trust me. Okay, okay. He said, Just hold yourself taut and just go down like a slide. It won't hurt a bit. Mm -hmm. So I did it, and it looked great. It okay. looked great. Good, good. Stuff good. like that. Yeah. The last show we did yeah. was Bruce was Bruce Lee. In fact, I wrote an article about that. I'll get that to you later. And I, I didn't know anything about him except he played Cato on The Green Hornet. Mm -hmm. he, was, he hadn't established his international reputation yet. But I never knew a guy with, uh, who was so at one with himself. He, he was in a different level of, of consciousness than anybody had ever seen. And so the, the story was that a little kid was beating up my kid, so I went to ball out his father, and his father was Bruce... Gordon, who played Frank Nitti on uh, Untouchables, and he, he scared me. Mm -hmm. So I went to Bruce Lee to learn self-defense and, and, and take care of myself. And so he said, the first thing you do, you strike fear into your opponent by going, yosh! And so I, w I went back to you know, all the stuff we did together. We just kind of were like Stern Rogers. We just made it all up, all this great stuff. It was, it was a wonderful moment. And then, so I went back to Bruce uh, Gordon's house, knocked on the door, and he said, come in. I said... Your son is still bothering my son. He said, oh, so what? And I go, yosh! And he, and he goes, yosh! And I look at the camera and I go, uh-oh. All, all the suits were there from New York. The only time they'd ever been there. And they were all laughing. I thought, oh, boy. And that was our last show. Oh, wow. And Jim Backus, who played the other, said, uh, at least we won't have to buy the crew Christmas presents. <laughs> but Bruce Lee was, I'll just give you an example. He, he, he said, put your hand out about waist high, and he put a penny in my hand. Mm -hmm. Then he was like like a hawk. He said, I'm going to come down and grab that penny before you can close your palm. And I said, he doesn't know I played sugar for it. I'm fast on the draw. Mm -hmm. My instincts are, I mean, reflexes. 
and, and all these people were gathered around. So he put the penny in my hand, and he said, ready? I said, ready. He went, <laughs> and I really felt sorry for the guy. He's an Asian guy. He's going to lose face. I could still feel the penny. Open my hand. It was a dime. Oh, my God. <laughs> Bruce Lee. God yeah, bless him. Yeah. Welcome to North Coast Subaru, the New York Metropolitan's only exclusive Subaru dealership. Come visit us at 105 Glen Street in Glen Cove, New York. Family owned and operated for over 30 years, we are known for our courteous service, no pressure sales approach, and knowledgeable sales professionals. Customers are welcome to browse through our showroom at their own pace or to test drive the latest vehicles in the Subaru lineup. At North Coast, we treat our customers like family. That's why year after year, We've received Subaru's highest honors for customer satisfaction. The staff at North Coast Subaru understands the importance of maintaining your vehicle at its optimum level of performance, and we want to help you protect your investment. Our certified technicians are factory trained and have the latest in automotive technology available to them in our on-site repair and collision shop. You can feel confident that your Subaru is in good hands when you leave your car with us. Come see the all-new 2012 Subaru Impreza. It features our legendary symmetrical all-wheel drive system, which gives it the capability to go just about anywhere. In Subaru fashion, this car was designed from the ground up with the latest active and passive safety features in mind. So stop in for a visit and receive the exceptional service that you deserve. Shopping for a new car has never been easier. At North Coast Subaru, we're small enough to serve you in a big way. Hello, and welcome to this week's Kevin's Corner TV. Today, we're at the North Hempstead Day at the Clinton G. Martin okay. Park. We're going back in time, and who we're going to meet is Theodore Roosevelt. Mr. President, it is an honor to meet you. Delighted, Kevin. How are you? Simply bullying, and I wish you the best with your publication. Thank you, thank you. So tell me, what has been happening with you since uh, the last slug? <laughs> well, I've been very busy. I believe it's important that our young people today understand history. In order to move on, you have to know where you've come from. Yeah. Okay, in reality, with, with Mr. Jim Foote, and he's the impersonator of Theodore Roosevelt. Reenact. Reenact. Re impersonator Re sounds borderline legal. Okay. <laughs> so, Jim, tell me how you got into this. Uh, I've always had an interest in history. It's one of my favorite subjects at school. I, Graduated from North Shore High School, 68, went to the United States Navy, and that's where I grew a mustache. At that time, you were allowed to grow mustaches, beards, sideburns. At one point, I had all of the above. When I finished my term in the Navy in 1972, I kept the mustache. Around 1975, people said, you look like Theodore Roosevelt. I was invited to a New Year's Eve costume party, and from there, I was asked to march to the Seacliff Landmarks Association following May. So yes, that 15 minutes of fame. But I quickly learned you can set yourself up for terrible embarrassment if you don't know the character you're dressed as. So once you start reading on those dog, his story is called being bitten by the colonel. You know, you, you learn a lot and uh, you find him so fascinating. So now I do about 20,000 miles a year. I've performed everywhere from uh, Comedy Central and Steve Colbert to the White House. Actually, they're both about the same. <laughs> now, um, who do you do for the White House? It was the Easter egg roll in 2000. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Right. That was uh, Clinton's last uh, Easter egg roll. Right. Now, being an impersonator, or what do you say? Being an actor. Being an actor of Theodore Roosevelt. Why? Um, tell, tell me about Theodore Roosevelt. Well, he was born as a, he was a sickly child. He wasn't expected to live. He was asthma. He had to overcome his ailments, so he always, always overcompensated for that. Uh, when he believed in something, he stuck by it. And his career, I mean, he was a rancher, a naturalist, an author, 36 books. And, uh, and he had something to do with the newspaper business, too. He worked for the Kansas City Star. Mm -hmm. 
Civil Service Commission, Police Commission of New York City, created the police department as we know it today. Created the parks department. Yeah, put land aside, which became national parks. Right. Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Governor of the state, Vice President, then President. Now, um, being him, impersonating him, do you? Uh, how has that been for you? I've had a lot of fun with it. I did it part time for years. In the last company I worked for, I was a machinist. One chapter eleven. So I couldn't got another machine job or move into this. And when I lecture kids, I say always look for the door of opportunity. Don't hesitate to take it. So I moved in doing this full time. Wow. So how many gigs do you do? There's Never one set amount of gigs per year, but it, it averages out to maybe about five a month. Wow. Okay. Good. For instance, I, yesterday I was at the Long Island Fair, and I'll be back there again tomorrow. Right. Excellent. Excellent. Um, when, uh, when you first got into it, uh, what did your family say about you being the person Well, we were both from Seacliff. All right. So you know how small town villages are. When I first started doing this, the founding fathers, the pillars of the community, you go. Look out, he thinks he's Teddy Roosevelt. Okay. <laughs> Those exact same people. Once I started getting media coverage and credibility, those exact same people. He makes us so proud. Uh, that's well, that's a lot of people. And I don't fault just the sequel, but a lot of people are a little hesitant of something new. Yeah. That's they quickly realized I don't blow a trumpet and run upstairs yelling bullies. Right, right, right. And how often are you asked, uh, just in the, in the regular setting, to do your theater work? Uh, I don't quite understand what you mean. You know, like uh, if you're at a party, does somebody say, hey, can you do this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, always people would know of what I do, they'll ask questions about it. Right. And I'll jump back and forth in the character. I'll give them a TR quote and a TO. Life is a great adventure, and I want to say to you, accept it in such a spirit. <laughs> now, you had to do a lot of uh, research into his voice and Yeah, he character. was the first president to be recorded. Yeah. Perhaps one of the most famous recordings they used in many documentaries. He was speaking to the young boys progressively mm -hmm. in 1950 in Sagamore Hill. One of the boys bought an Edison machine to record it. I want to see you, boy, join the party and conduct yourself as in a football game. In other words, don't flinch, don't foul, but hit the line hard. Mm. So you got it. He, he did and this. And he always did this. Yeah, that, that was his hand job. Right. And right. he'd always exaggerate. I hope I'm out of frame here. You know, he'd have his hands up like this, making a point. Right. Just keep in mind, they didn't have the close-up back then. Right. He spoke to a thousand people in the audience. You want that person in the back of the audience. To see what you're doing. That's a way of emphasizing a, a statement. Right. Right. He was always very motivated. You know, motivated. Well, one of his uh, habits, he consumed about three quarts of coffee a day. So. Wow. And that goes back to when he had asthma. That was one of the things that gave you really strong black coffee. Right. So he still uh, did. Did you drink coffee? <laughs> yeah. That's if, part you, of the role. if you drive through Sequel, and I'm not doing TR, I'm usually sitting at John Burns Green. Right. Drinking a big cup of iced coffee. Always in character, right? <laughs> That's great. All right. Thank you. I appreciate your time. All right. One more last word is TR. Yeah. You have me in frame here? Far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, although checkered by failure. No take rank for those poor to spirits that neither suffer much nor enjoy much. For they dwell in that great twilight that knows not victory nor defeat. Keep your eyes on the stars, but remember to keep your feet on the ground. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Are you going to catch any of this? Yeah. Okay.
Thank you.